and that sort of stuff about Deleuze is worrying to me. Like he just he's a bit too uncritical. If, if especially if he's writing a book called Critical and Clinical, I'm not buying. I think again, I think it'd be a worthwhile discussion. I'm not sure if it's as yeah, it would be worthwhile having a discussion around that because I'd have to go specifically point by point and really sort of get into it. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was I, more of a yeah, sense that yeah, I wanted I, to express that I've gotten recently after I finished the book, which I enjoyed, by the way. It was a very enjoyable read, but uh, it's more of a sense I got. Yeah, um, I mean, essay, Essays Critical and Critical is, right? is a unique piece because it's it's not really haven't it's, it wasn't intended to be sort of a collected set of texts sort of in its own way the way that he sort of put it down um it's a how to put it it's a unique work in a lot of what sort of Deleuze was doing at the time I, again uh when it's not one of his specific works that he's gone out with and it is a collection of essays there's probably through lines that we can draw that i'm more hesitant to say we should than anything but, you know, it's also, um, it's a Dan Smith translation. So it is also a, a decent translation. I think good work done there. So I think, again, it'd be worthwhile for us to have that conversation at some point. Yeah, I am glad to open it up in the, in the uh, you know, in the, or to bring it at least to some attention here in the discourse. Cool. Um, I think though today we are here for AO. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We're in three dot four page. I, I had us at page one seventy. Am I off there? Anyone? Uh, that sounds right to me. Uh, how are we to understand? Correct. Yeah, I'm with him. All right, good enough. That works fine for me. Uh, then I'll just kick us off. We'll get Craigbot in here, so we have that. Uh, and I'll say, hey, everyone. Come on, Craig. What the fuck? Craig got kicked. Okay, one second. Give me two seconds. I've got to fix a thing because that's fantastic. It's my favorite thing. Give me two seconds. Sorry, everyone. <sighs> of course. I've had just the worst time with so many of these things. I had uh, my uh, credit card was stolen in... Uh, I, via Wi-Fi, I was using my credit cards and they were stolen when I was in um, London, which is wonderful to be stuck in a foreign country with literally no ability to get to money in any way. Um, what I didn't know, and it's a thing I'm now telling people, when you call and you say, hey, Chase, someone stole my credit cards. They go, oh, we'll issue you new ones. Um, there's a handful of partners um, uh uh, that they will just update <laughs> with the new card. So if the asshole who's stealing your credit card uses it for, say, Uber or DoorDash or a bunch of other things, uh, they just get updated with your card information and so thus get to keep stealing your credit card. Three times Chase did this before they decided not to update digitally. Just uh, fun things there. So... Let's see if let's, let's see if that fixed it. No. Fine. Well, let's get. I know we still have Craigbot here, so let's just get him in. Hey, look at this way, buddy. At least it wasn't the Welsh. Yeah, something like that. Well, that's okay. I'm recording on YouTube. That'll be fine. Uh, we are at three point four. Um, and we will be continuing basically from that point forward. That's the uh, overall hope, at least. So we'll see what happens there. Um, let's see. And let me share my screen. 
And we will just continue from that spot. Uh, I heard someone pop in. What's up? No? All right. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the Deleuze and Guattari Quarantine Collective's ongoing reading of Anti-Oedipus. We're going to be making our way through 3.4, 3.4, uh, page 170, um, as we continue sort of talking through how Oedipalization works, happens, how we see it, why we see it, and how the, uh, the way of myths and stories uh, operates with us. Uh, as we go, please uh, don't hesitate to jump in the chat, ask a question. Uh, yell at us, whatever it may be. We will do our best to make our way through and see what we can do here. <coughs> and with that, how are we to understand the phrases with which MC and Edmund... Oh, oh, or wait, Brett, what? Before you begin. Oh, I, God. That I, wanted, I wanted to start out with just something that we touched on last week. Oh, please. Yeah, so... So like you said, this is like a, this is a section about Oedipalization on that. One of the major focuses in the section and um, kind of the target of the Oedipalization, if you will, right, is um, ethnicity, right? So it's, uh, the section is actually called Psychoanalysis and Ethnology. So last week we touched on this a little bit. And Brutz, I know you, you wanted me to kind of bring um, some some material forward on this. So I'll, I'll do this real briefly, but especially because for some reason I keep thinking the racial is tied to the, uh, to the second synthesis. And I think in part that's true, but where I found a lot of the, the, um, the, the quotes I'll be sharing real briefly now was actually dealing with the, the third synthesis. So just so we have this material as we're going through this, so we kind of have a way to think about what they're getting at with ethnicity um, and how to work with some of this material in terms of the ethnic. Um, so this is from 85, page 85, right? This is chapter two, and they're going through the paralogisms. Um, the first things to be distributed on the body of the organs are races, cultures, and their gods. The fact has often been overlooked that the schizo indeed participates in history. He hallucinates and raves universal history and proliferates the races. All delirium is racial, which does not necessarily mean racist. It is not a matter of the regions of the BWO, so-called representing races and cultures. The full body does not represent anything at all. On the contrary, the races and cultures designate regions on this body, that is, zones of intensities, fields of potential phenomena of individualization and sexualization are produced within these fields. We pass from one field to another by crossing thresholds. We never stop migrating. Uh, so I'll stop there. I've only got one more after that. But so basically, as you can see, right, the racial here is being understood as zones of intensities on the full body. So I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the word racial because I think it kind of I would prefer the, the term ethnicity for the connotation, because racial usually kind of gets at something more essential. Um, the, the big thing to take away from this, right, is when we're talking about ethnicities, right, we're talking about zones of intensities that in part produce people the same way that they're talking about sexuality here. But sexuality in the sense we're more commonly used to, as opposed to their specific um, definition. Right, so if you think back to some of our previous discussions, that touches on that. Uh, notice the theme of crossing and migrating. This last quote I'll read, we'll touch on it again. Uh, and this is basically where they, this is where you're basically going to get the racial racist distinction. The, this is page 105. The nomadic and polyvocal use of the conjunctive synthesis is in opposition to the segregative and by univocal use. Delirium has something like two poles, racist and racial, paranoiat segregative and schizonomatic. And between the two, ever so many subtle, uncertain shiftings where the unconscious itself oscillates between its reactionary charge and its revolutionary potential. So the big thing to take away from this, right, is there's two possible uses um, of what I would call the ethnic here or just 
like they're explaining, right? That in terms of two poles, the racial and the racist. With the racial, right, we're talking about the nomadic use. With the racist, we're going to be talking about the segregated and bi-univocal uses. So as we're going through that, right, this is part of the states of that third synthesis and how some of this argument is going to function. And I'll give it back to you there, Brutz. No, I think that's a great explanation of it. Thank you. Does Very everyone hard. does everyone understand what he's talking about here? Because this was that was a it was a complicated thing to go over right away. By the way, usually we got to work our I, way into it. I I did it quick as a crash course because everybody wants to read that next paragraph. So. All right, that works. Cool. All yours, buddy. How are we to understand? the phrases with which M.C. and Edmund Ortiz conclude their book. Quote, <clears throat> let me just scroll down. Illness is considered as a sign of an election, of a special attention coming from supernatural powers, or as a sign of an aggression of a magical nature, an idea that is difficult to express in profane terms. Analytic psychotherapy can intervene only starting from the moment a demand can be formulated by the subject. Our entire research was therefore conditioned by the possibility of establishing a psychoanalytic domain. When a subject adhered fully to the traditional norms and had nothing to say in his own name, he allowed himself to be taken into the care of the traditional therapists and the familial group, or into that of the medical practice of medicines. At times, the fact he wanted to speak to us about traditional treatments corresponded to a beginning of psychotherapy and became for him a means of situating himself personally in his own society. At other times, the analytic dialogue was able to unfold to a greater extent, and in this case, the edible problem tended to assume its dichronic dimension, causing the generation gap to appear." End quote. Why think that supernatural powers and magical aggressions constitute a myth that is inferior to Oedipus? On the contrary, is it not true that they move desire in the direction of more intense and more adequate investments of the social field in, the org in its organization as well as its disorganizations? Meyerfort at least showed Job's place beside Oedipus. And what entitles one to determine that the subject has nothing to say in his own name, so long as he adheres to traditional norms? Doesn't the Indembu cure demonstrate just the opposite? Could it not be said that Oedipus is also a traditional norm, our own to be exact? How can one say that Oedipus makes us speak in our own name when one also goes on to say that its resolution teaches us, quote, the incurable inadequacy of being? and universal castration. And what is this demand that is invoked to justify Oedipus? It goes without saying. <clears throat> the subject demands and re-demands daddy-mommy. But which subject, and in what state? Is that the means to situate oneself personally in one's own society? And which society? The neo-colonized society that is constructed for the subject and that finally succeeds in what colonization was only able to outline, an effective reduction of the forces of desire to Oedipus, to a father's name in the grotesque triangle. As, as the world of colonization happened, uh, and again, we're talking about some very contemporaneous things to this, uh, much closer to this than I think to us. We're talking about you know a lot of books that were written in the fifties, sixties, maybe even earlier, as uh, these areas that were once, uh, you know, we'll say, not as colonized as the French, especially, but not just the French. It was the French, the Danish, the Spanish, everyone sort of began taking over these areas. The the way that we dealt with them, and again, they made the comment in the quip earlier, uh, just a paragraph or two ago, about the progressive psychoanalysts traveling to help and, and sustain and be there for these these poor, poor, poor indigenous people. The the commentary they're continuing to make is, hey, isn't the way that they handled that much 
much closer to the way that they were built, the way that their society is built, the way that they function, their machinery. By adding ours, aren't we doing a bit more? Aren't we adding in our own traditional norms? Aren't we overriding theirs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Very, I would say uh, now, a very, mm, I would say probably more common or uh, more known sort of critique of how we deal with social norms, uh, especially amongst uh, indigenous people. But at the time, uh, big deal. But that's a, a lot of this, again, the, the, the push they're making as they make their way towards the critique of Oedipus, the de-universalizing of it, the way that Oedipus is manufactured, the way manu uh, Oedipus is built and the way it shifts culturally is really what this paragraph is about. And we could get into some of their very, very particular critiques but I'm hesitant to because I think it's down the wrong road. I don't know. I'm open if someone wants to do that. But for me, it's less that, I think. Jack? Huh? I mean, I think this, I, I kind of agree with what you're getting at. Like the paragraphs, I think this is one of the more straightforward ones, right? If you notice, one of the things they're questioning here is, um, if Oedipus is a kind of cultural norm, right, why is it the cultural norm that prevails over other cultural norms, right? So if you if you like, in a manner of speaking, right, um, why couldn't the subject be in the Job effect? If we think kind of of the previous section, right, in terms of like, you know, the Heliogabalus effect, the Joan of Arc effect, and so on. But why couldn't the subject be in a Job, a Job effect? Right as opposed to the effects always being kind of uh, castigated through Oedipus, right? Mm -hmm. But they're also broaching, like, notice kind of the, the, the cultural side of it too, right? Uh, this point about, like, the difference in, uh, say, societies come, um, interacting here, right? If we're thinking about it territorially, right? Oedipus is at once a cultural norm for us and takes on this larger um, yoking role, right? And that that in, that impacts the way that um, the passage between the two cultures works. Who has questions here? Anything anyone wants to dive in, go a little deeper? Or do we want to just keep moving because there's just a lot of Oedipus and psychoanalytic sort of critiques coming along here? I'm open. I'm open. All right, fair enough. Yes, just to tack on one final thing then. No, notice they're focusing on the subject here more too, right? What is the so-called demand that is invoked justify Oedipus? It goes without saying the subject demands and re-demands daddy mommy. But which subject and in what state, right? So like if we're thinking in that zones, like kind of third synthesis mode here, right? Where where is the subject, um, spatially speaking? What is that subject under which effect are they, so to speak? And what is this interaction with Oedipus that's impacting um, that subject here, right? Notice there's kind of like a, um, there's kind of like a series going on there, or like a kind of process, if you will. All right, we'll move to the next paragraph, which is a, a little bit more at the center of really what they're trying to get at anyway. So let's do that. Excellent. <clears throat> Let us return to the well-known and inexhaustible debate between the culturalists 
and Orthodox psychoanalysts. Is Oedipus universal? Is Oedipus the great paternal Catholic symbol, the meeting place of all the churches? The great debate the debate began between Malinowski and Jones. It continued between Cardiner and Fromm on one side and Roheim on the other. It is still pursued between certain ethnologists and certain disciples of Lacan, those who offered not only an Oedipalizing interpretation of Lacan's doctrine, but also an ethnographic extension to this interpretation. On the side of the universal, there are two poles. One, outdated it would seem, that makes of Oedipus an original, effective constellation, and that constitutes an extreme position, arguing that Oedipus was a real event whose effects were transmitted through phylogenetic heredity. On the other pole, which makes Oedipus into a structure, a pole whose extreme position argues the possibility of discovering the structure in fantasy in relation to biological prematuration and neoteny. Two very different conceptions of the limit, one as original matrix, the other as structural function. But in both these senses of the universal, we are invited to interpret. Since the latent presence of Oedipus appears only through its patent absence, understood as an effect of psychic repression, or better still, since the structural constant is discovered only through its imaginary variations, attesting to the need for symbolic foreclosure, the father as an empty position. Oedipus as universal recommences the old metaphysical operation that consists in interpreting negation as a deprivation, as a lack. The symbolic lack of the dead father or the great signifier. Interpretation is our modern way of believing and of being pious. Already, Geza Roheim proposed organizing primitives into a series of variables converging toward a structural neotenic constant. It was he who said in all seriousness that the Oedipus complex was not to be found if it wasn't looked for, and that one wasn't looking if one hadn't had oneself analyzed. And that is why your daughter is mute, which is to say the tribes, daughters of the ethnologist, do not say Oedipus, although it is Oedipus who makes them speak. Roheim added that it was ridiculous to think that the Freudian theory of censorship depended on the repressive regime in the empire of Franz Josef. He did not seem to see that Franz Josef was not a pertinent historical break, but that perhaps the oral, the written, or even the capitalist civilizations were such breaks with which the nature of social repression and the meaning and scope of psychic repression would vary. More and more we're uh, dealing with their critiques of psychoanalysis. Um, and again, the the broad stroke of this paragraph is the critique and the idea of Oedipus being universal. They're really trying to drive away from that as much as possible. And they're talking about sort of the two sides of the, of the Oedipus debate. Um, and you can feel the barbs being flung by Guattari at a handful of his probably uh, people he knows for certain. Uh, on the one side, people who actually think that there is uh, this sort of actual event that happened, that Oedipus happened, and this gets transmitted through sort of this odd phylogenetic heredity. And the other, which is this structuralist view, that we can find Oedipus elsewhere, that we can find Oedipus through in fantasy and, and all of these elements, it's always in relation to the sort of biological, the, the, the biological prematuration and neoteny. These different conceptions of the limit, one as matrix, one as function, this back and forth. <clears throat> this ultimately uh, were invented to interpret as they say, since the latest, the latent presence of Oedipus appears only through its absence. Um, with they have the great line from Roheim that they're just shocked uh, that he says, where he's like, uh, "Well, uh, you can't find Oedipus if you're not looking for it," which is awesome. Sort of as a statement when people are so upfront like that, it's just great. Um, so it's uh, again just 
continuing to critique this fact that we start from Oedipus, we go looking for Oedipus, miraculously we find Oedipus, and of course we then repeat Oedipus and, and instill it in those we're analyzing, as you might say, or in ourselves, because we have to also be analyzed because we can't even look until we've been analyzed ourselves, which is wild. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the statement about modern piety being a state of interpretation is a wonderful line as well. I agree, Arachne. It's good stuff. I do want to move to the next paragraph. I, I, I always try to get through this section so, so much faster. Because uh, it's a few paragraphs, as I said, that is like, feels tiring to me. I don't know. Jack, what do you got for me? Anyone? Yeah. To add to that, uh, and yeah, so right now some of the stuff is like fairly straightforward, right? Like you're saying, this is still getting at the whole universalization uh, question, right? Um, one thing I would add to this discussion is, so, so there's two poles here, right? And they're saying this is kind of a perennial variation on the two poles, which, which makes it kind of easy. Um, the part I wanted to focus on here was Two very, diff two very different conceptions of the limit, one as original matrix, the other as structural function. But in both these senses of the universal, we are invited to perhaps interpret since the latent presence of Oedipus uh, appears only through its patent absence, understood as an effect of psycho psychic repression. Uh, and then they go into foreclosure, and I don't need to focus too much on that right now. Um, so the thing I wanted to add about this is notice they're talking about the limit here, right? So this is one thing that um, um, the Oedipus ties into, but especially when we're talking about social production and desiring production and the delirium, right? The limit's going to play a, a pretty big role here. So in this sense, right, Oedipus is the disfigured image in the, in the structure of um, representation repression. One of the things that ties to is the limit of social production, which is incest. The reason I'm bringing this up is, um, as much as they're criticizing here, they're also looking at how this move plays a functional role, right? And what's going on in terms of production, that it's not just a, a simple matter of you have your story and we have our story, right? But that it's also in this sense, it's two ways of conceiving of the limit, right? So the, the limit of um, Oedipus and incest on one hand can function as an original matrix, or on the other hand, as a structural function, right? And this is what makes the interpretation they're talking about possible. So to, to try not to overread like interpretation, and you know, like was Eco uh, wrong about that? Notice interpretation here is tied to these two functions and how um, how that kind of move it relies on certain things for interpretation to take place. So it's not so much people looking at something and trying to make sense of it of their own accord or whatever. They're talking about something like um, the signification, the actual production, as though it stems from either an original matrix or as a structural function, both in kind of a point of departure, but also in terms of a limit or like a point of arrival um, kind of way of thinking about it. That, that's all I would really add to them from this one. And I don't think foreclosure is really a big thing after 2013 in the U.S. No, not really. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good joke. Not bad pun. Uh, I'll give it to you. Uh, good. I was worried you'd take it away. Yeah. Um, the next little bit here, uh, the next paragraph is, uh, let me see, do they break this one up into two or is this, yeah, they, they break this into two for some reason again. That's okay. Um, the next two paragraphs certainly are one in the original French. Uh, we will stop at the break and see if there's any questions, but we'll try to move through it all at once because it is, intended to be a very large comment uh, and a large sort of singular thought. So um, please uh, 
don't hesitate to uh, ask questions as we go. <clears throat> this story of psychic repression is quite complicated. Things would be simpler if the libido or the affect were repressed in the most general sense of the word, suppressed, inhibited, transformed. At the same time as the supposed Oedipal representation. But such is not the case. Most ethnologists have clearly noted the sexual nature of affects in the public symbols of primitive societies, and this nature remains integrally lived by the members of these societies, even though they have not been psychoanalyzed, and in spite of the displacement of the representation. As Leach says apropos of the sex-hair relationship, quote, displaced phallic symbolism is very common, but the phallic origin of the symbolism is not repressed, end quote. Must it be said that primitives repress the representation and keep the affect intact? And would the contrary be true in our case, in the patriarchal organization where the representation would remain clear, but with the effects suppressed, inhibited, or transformed? No, in fact, psychoanalysis tells us that we too repress the representation, and everything tells us that we too often keep the full sexuality of the affect. We know perfectly well what it is about without having been psychoanalyzed. But what enables one to speak of an Oedipal representation that would be the object of repression? Is it because incest is prohibited? We always fall back on this pale rationale. Incest is desired because it is prohibited. The prohibition of incest would therefore imply an Oedipal representation. It would be born of the repression of this representation of the latter's return. Now the opposite is clearly the case. Not only does the Oedipal representation presuppose the prohibition of incest, but it is not even possible to say that the representation is born of the prohibition or results from it. Uh, uh, where do we start with this paragraph? <clears throat> yes, I'd, I'd kick it off from the back of it, I guess. No, notice like this is exactly what I was just talking about, is the way the, the limit relates to the fourth paralogism, and they've just walked in the fifth pro, uh, paralogism here, right? Prohibition of incest would therefore imply an edible representation, and it would be born of repression of this representation and of the latter's return. Now, the opposite is clearly the case. Not only does the edible representation presuppose the prohibition of incest, but it's not even possible to say the representation is born of the prohibition or results from it. So, really, the fifth is kind of like taking Oedipus as a pre given and um, basically working forward from everything in that sense, right? Where the, even though it's virtual, we take it as like the actual and the necessary actualization to really summary it. Notice how it's all getting connected here so that when we, we walk back from fifth to fourth to third, right? The thing that's basically going on is with incest as this limit, one of the things we're starting to get here is that we have the ethnic being um, evolved and we have it possible to repress it through certain segregative uses. And we can think of the distribution here taking on exclusive disjunctions um, as part of this repression, just as a starting point. Yeah, I mean, they're basically just, I, again, I it it's it's tough to say anything but they're continuing the same critique as you said they're now moving through the paralogism sort of backwards uh you know fifth and fourth but the the point they're making is again still the same I, when we talk about uh the repression of elements and the representation and how it gets repressed is it that it's being repressed and they start they're basically pointing out that mm, this is not the case that we we have this really strange thing that happens where psychoanalysis tells us that we too, even in this capitalist space, but it's the same for everyone. We're all repressing this representation. Everything tells us we too often keep the full sexuality of the affect, the, the passions uh, that cause the neurotism, perversion, 
other elements inside of traditional psychoanalysis that that all of this we don't even have to be psychoanalyzed so wait why why is this the case and it's always the same thing it's because incest is prohibited look at the look at the primitive tribes they also repress it and it's like good god we always fall back on this we're always sort of pushing this and and keeping this case and they're like the the opposite of this is clearly the case not only does the oedipal representation the way that um the oedipus is is and repression happens presuppose this prohibition but you can't even say that the representation is born of the prohibition or results from it there we're now in this place where things are becoming very clearly uh not connected very clearly uh, uh, illogical leaps have been made and they're about to go into uh reich who really did some amazing things with freud and with lack and with oedipus um uh, which is the second half of this paragraph in the original French. So I kind of want to dive into it unless there's a questions on this paragraph specifically. Anyone, please. Anyone? All right. If no one's got a question there, just to, I, I kind of underlined the fifth and fourth there, just to underline the third synthesis a little bit here. It's like if you notice, right, things would be simpler if the libido or the affect were, impre were impressed, were repressed in the most general sense of the word, right? So notice affect is being called out here, like Brutz was getting at. Um, so, so we're in this language of the third synthesis, right? With an important question, must it be said that the primitives, I'm sorry, must it be said that primitives repress the representation and keep the affect intact? So like language of subjectivity here, right? The intensities that the subject traverses, consume, and are consummated by, right? And would the contrary be true in our case if the patriarchal organization where the representation would remain clear but with the affect suppressed and inhibited or transformed, no, in fact, psychoanalysis tells us that we too oppress the representation and everything tells us that we too often keep the full sexuality of the affect. We know perfectly well what it is about without having been psychoanalyzed uh, and stopping there, right? And just to put that into a point, notice how in this paragraph, right, um, and actually the last few, they're really shifting into how subjectivity, the territories themselves, the affects and the intensities um, are affected by representation and repression, but also the role they play in social production. And I've kind of keep bringing that up, but it's, it's a major thing because usually we focus on the second synthesis or, or quite often it feels that way. Here they're focusing on the third. And for you, because again, the numbering matters less, what is the second and third synthesis? Just so we know the numbering schema you're using. Yeah, no problem, man. Uh, second being the disjunction, third being um, uh, the consummative. So the, Se the second is the disjunction, which is the double bind, the, the exclusive use uh, of the double bind, which basically forces binaries, correct? Yeah, it puts in that either or, yes. as opposed to the either or or. Correct. Uh, and then the third's like, it's the nomadic versus segregative use. Um, so for the subject traversing all the gradients, consuming the intensities, right? And the way mm -hmm. those intensities themselves function, right? We have them in this kind of, um, it's almost like drift, if you if you know the kind of uh, light situationist term, right? But in that general sense of just moving along nomadically, as opposed to where it becomes, well, segregated, right? And I think we'll get more on what that means here, but probably the word itself can kind of leans into what they're they're kind of uh, gearing at here. They've commonly used the term for the third as the the paralogism of application, because you're talking about the illegitimate use of the conjunctive, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Which is uh, basically the, the nature of saying us, them, uh, uh, universalizing things that sort of uh, we, we apply to the us versus them. 
versus allowing the sort of, uh, f- sort of, I don't want to say free form, but a, a much more nomadic uh, and polyvocal identity that sort of comes through. Uh, because again, it's the conjunctive, the, the order I've gone. And I think it's what you're doing, Jack is connective, disjunctive, conjunctive, and then the two critiques of representation are four and five, just to mention, because it's a pain in the ass really. Uh, Cause I know, uh, I think Holland does it a different order. Um, I know the PDF from anarchist without content we've used has them in a completely different order than this, but I don't think it's like trying to number them in order, but Yeah. One of the many things that would be great to sort of go over at some point. I got you there. Yeah, so fourth would be displacement. Fifth would be, it's basically Oedipus through actualization. The afterward. Uh, yeah, I, I think that this sounds right. Yeah, like it's the afterwards, the, the whole person, the, the, the totalizing whole body. And yeah, going back to your point on application, though. And you can kind of see that in what they're talking about, right? They're talking about this use of meaning and interpretation where we work forward from kind of the originary matrix, right? Kind of the, the primordial beginning, if you will, um, or we just derive it from a structure, right? That's part of the language of application gets into how that usage works. Yes. And how, and how it begins again, these things pile into each other as Jack is showing. And as they're talking through here, that it's not just this displacement happens. Oh, that's this, uh, this paralogism happened. Oh no, that's bad. But it's like, no, no, it's these things compound each other. And again, since they're happening imminently to each other through the syntheses, you're talking about everything becoming compounded upon compounded. It's, it's a, it's an extraordinary sort of explosion of paralogisms as soon as they really start hitting, especially with how Oedipus uh, interacts with them and creates these exclusive and restrictive uh, disjunctions. But it starts even before then. So it's, it's a wild sort of thing. Yeah, man. Good shout out. Excellent. We'll get to the second half of this paragraph now. <clears throat> Adopting Malinowski's arguments, Reich added a profound remark. Desire is all the more Oedipal as the prohibitions are aimed, not simply at incest, but, quote, at all other types of sexual relations, end quote, blocking the other paths. In a word, the repression of incest is not born of a repressed Oedipal representation any more than it provokes this repression. But, and this is something altogether different, the general social repression psychic repression system gives rise to an Oedipal image as a disfiguration of the repressed. The fact that this image in turn finally suffers a repression, that it comes to take the place of the repressed or of the thing that is effectively desired, and so far as sexual repression is directed at something other than incest, such is the long history of our society. But the repressed is not, first of all, the Oedipal repression, representation. What is repressed is desiring production. It is the part of this production that does not enter into social production or reproduction. It is what would introduce disorder and revolution into the socius, the non-coded flows of desire. The part that passes, on the contrary, from desiring production to social production forms a direct sexual investment of the social production without any repression of a sexual nature of the symbolism and the corresponding effects, and above all, without any reference to an Oedipal representation that could be held to be originally repressed or structurally foreclosed. The animal in us is not merely the object of a pre-conscious investment determined by interest, but the object of a libidinal investment of desire that only secondarily derives an image of the father from desiring production. The same holds true for the libidinal investment of food, wherever a fear of going hungry is evident, or a pleasure at not being hungry, and this investment refers only secondarily to an image of the mother. We have already seen how the prohibition of incest referred not to Oedipus, but to the non-coded flows that constitute desire and to their representative, the intense prepersonal flow. As for Oedipus, 
It is another way of coding the uncodable, of codifying what eludes the codes, or of displacing desire in its object, in a way, in trapping them. So good. Um, I hate the word flow. I'm not going to rant about it today. I hate it so much. It's not the word flow in the original. Um, it's worth mentioning from Cardiner. Abram Cardiner convincingly demonstrated the role of a collective or economic elementary anxiety that, even from the viewpoint of the unconscious, does not allow itself to be reduced to the familial relationship of the mother with the mother. Uh, it's the individual in his society was his book. Here's what they're, they're driving at as they make their way through this entire massive, massive paragraph, which includes the previous. As we talk about repression, as we talk about, oh, we come back, oh, it's because of incest. I mean, look, we've got to be very careful there. We don't want to go too far as incest. It's, wait, 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 wait. Everything then comes back to that, but that's not how this works. That's not how we find ourselves socially or societally. It, the reality is, as they say, the repression of incest is not born of a repressed Oedipal representation any more than it provokes it. The general social repression, psychic repression system, that combinatory thing of the social repression coming in and then the psychic repression internal to us that sort of goes out and, and creates. This repression system gives rise to this Oedipal image as a disfiguration of the repressed. It is not actually the image of the real thing. This is traditionally how psychoanalysis looks at it. It's not this. It's a disfiguration of it. This is the problem that they have, this this creation of this sort of uh, disfigured element. And this disfigured element uh, ultimately suffers repression, and it comes to take the place of the repressed or the thing that is effectively desired insofar as sexual repression is directed at something other than incest, such as the long history of our society. That, that sentence is the formative one that you should be taking away from like this and like the last two paragraphs in my opinion. Uh, the fact this image in turn finally suffers. This is this disfigured. It's not actually when we went through, when we talked through sort of the, the way Oedipus uh, uh, creates the sort of secondary element, this, this image of the repressed that isn't it. It's a disfigured image, but this odd other thing, this comes to take the place of the repressed insofar as sexual oppression is directed at something other than incest. This, delay of desire because we have this disfigured image, this secondary thing, this, this moment, this repression that comes, this is not, first of all, Oedipal representation. What is repressed is not that it is desiring production. The part of this production that does not enter into social production or reproduction. Uh, it is the base layer as these things are connecting, as these elements are happening, we hit this place where desire has this is stymied is, is 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 pushed is repressed is fucked with because desire doesn't know the difference it doesn't understand anything it's just desire it's trying to connect shit this desire that's this free thing that hasn't been codified yet that hasn't been placed that is sort of this this lower level flux this would be disorder this would be chaos. This would be revolution introduced socially into these non-coded fluxes of desire that would destroy it. The part that passes, on the contrary, from desiring production, this internal, to social production, forms a direct sexual investment of this social production without any repression of a sexual nature from the symbolism and corresponding affects. And above all, without any reference to an Oedipal representation that could be held to be originally repressed or structurally foreclosed. It has nothing to do with that. It doesn't even matter. We directly invest sexually, directly invest socially in the social the world of social production. And it's done with desiring production having been fucked up with these things. It's this, it's this really brutal system that starts at that very first level. As we've been talking about the five paralogisms, starting with the connective synthesis, we have this detachable part object into a, into a complete object. The phallus, uh, for example, it's by univocalization of objects, a single term from it. When we suddenly have these images and these elements that supposedly desire is able to connect, 
starts there, continues on its way through. Desire continues to have layers of bullshit layered into it to be fucked with, to be changed, to be, to be malformed as it's doing its thing socially. This is what they're driving at. The same holds true for the libidinal investment of food. It, it's all of these elements. The animal in us is not merely the object of a pre-conscious investment determined by interest. This is, um, uh, it isn't simply your place in society, your uh, pre-conscious investment um, of being a uh, working class, of being a, a prole, of being uh, bourgeois, whatever it may be. It's not merely this thing, but instead it's actually playing around with this libidinal investment of desire that only secondarily derives an image of the father from desiring production. Now it's got its master through the father. And then suddenly we have this other side where, where there's lack, where we have this libidinal investment of food whenever fear of growing hungry is evident or pleasure at not being hungry. This investment is only secondarily, not primarily, secondarily refers to the image of the mother. This is the Oedipalization of desire. And this prohibition of incest refers not to evident, not to Oedipus. It's not about that, but to the non-coded flows that constitute desire to their representative, the intense personal flux, the, the flux of becoming that is effectively all of us, uh, that is always happening. This this element that is that is happening becomes triangulated. And this is the malformation of desire as it goes out. Just as just as when we talk about and we they 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 did with the the earth, and we talk about how desire and your sort of uh desiring machines as you exist, your subjectivity, uh, what you want is in line with what the earth wants, what the earth needs, what, what the setup is, because you're just right there. The way that the uh, filiative and alliant lines are demarcated in the earth as productions happened, as you've happened, as you've grown, as you've done things, you're going to be in line with that. There's no Oedipus there. They don't have incest in the same way. It's they don't have Oedipus in the same way. We we see the prohibition and we presume the cause being Oedipus. It's not even the cause within us. Oedipus and how it functions. It isn't about Oedipus. It's about the secondary effects of what this sort of odd prohibition does. About the way that the nuclear family operates. About the way that these things come together that create this repression. That we see and we call what we think it is, but it is actually these other elements that are primary. Oedipus is ultimately only secondarily involved in it. And this is the core of their critique. And they're going to continue really pushing through this as we get through the rest of this. And we talk through how we finally get to Oedipus because we're not there yet. Um, how we recognize it, why we recognize it, why we call it what it is, and how we got stuck doing so uh, is is a big thrust of this entire chapter. I'll shut up. That was my long ramble. Please, uh, Jack, anyone, jump in. Now would be the time. Yeah. Uh, before I do, does any... <laughs> so we get some other voices um, besides Brinson and me. Does anybody... I uh, want to jump in first, ask a question or comment on, on uh, what was read or what, what Brett's just offered. There has to be somebody. Come on, people. All right, well, if something comes to mind, feel free to interject. Um, so the thing I, uh, the, the, the expansion I'd like to offer, what, what we're discussing here, right? Um, so with sexuality, really, we've talked about this. There's kind of like 
two um, senses of this word, right? The one we're used to in terms of sexuality, and then the one you get in uh, basically chapter four that gives their their kind of specialized definition of it, right? So when Deleuze and Guattari are talking about sexuality, one of the things they're driving at, um, if you'll allow the pun, I suppose, is production and reproduction itself, right? Which for them is going to be kind of how they define sexuality um, in kind of a proper sense versus a kind of improper sense where it becomes progression and regression. Or you can think of this kind of like the, um, the syntheses and the paralogisms, right? The proper use and the improper use. So as they're going through this, right, to kind of walk this into what we're going to, so we get we get some um, like functionality in terms of like the marginalization, the codification, what sexual repression is doing here, um, uh, and why Oedipus kind of clo uh, becomes a cloak for it, so to speak. All right, so remember, like in the second synthesis, a lot of what's taking place is that the, the drives and the inscriptions are going to function in terms of the affiliative and the alliant, right? So that those kind of familial uh, possibilities, right, get repressed through their political and economic possibilities, right? And, and that's kind of connecting it with the fourth um, paralogism here, right? So the thing that they're driving at with this, right, is if codification is about kind of working with this limit so as to bridge the um, the intensive and the extensive affiliations, right? Then codification is a way of working with how these drives and how these lines will function so that sexuality itself in that sense um, works through affiliation and alliance, right? Both in terms of its own repression and in terms of its own production, right? So tying that into here, when we're talking about codification a lot, right, that's a lot of the meat of what we're getting at, right? The meaning, the interpretation is going to be on one hand dealing with affiliation alliance. On the other hand, it's going to get yoked through Oedipus as we've seen, right? So you have this kind of, um, I, I always think of like, uh, and I don't know if you guys went through them, but we had overhead projectors when I was in grade school. Right, and you could superimpose images, right? It's a similar point in the way structure can be superimposed on top of disjunction, so that you're still dealing with both, but you deal with um, kind of a primary thing uh, in that level, right? And that that's what Oedipus will do, right? It will kind of take that over. So as we're dealing with this, when we see it is what would introduce disorder and revolution into the socius, the non-coded flows of desire, right? Once again, that thing getting marginalized, that thing with the revolutionary potential is going to be what would basically function in the affiliate of an alliant without necessarily being coded through affiliation alliance. So the economic and political would not here be able to repress that necessarily. By the same token, this would mean more than the germinal influx. So in terms of the multiplicity, right? Just like they're saying with, um, with, uh, with Reich here, all other types of sexual relations, the other paths would become unblocked, right? So you have this expansion in the network, but in the way that everything can connect and relate. So at your first synthesis level, at your second synthesis um, level is the wrong word, but I'll stick with it, right? The affiliations and the alliances themselves change. And the inscriptions here can no longer rely on that kind of meaning uh, through the signifier since we're in the primitive. By the same token, subjectivity, right? It's going to function in a, in a little bit of a different way here because it's going to take on the intensities, not only in that more nomadic way, but it's going to it's going to basically change how ethnicity is functioning here. So it could break down kind of some of those racist. Um, you know, segregations that we've talked about, it can break down um, kind of the segregation between territories there too. So the drift is, shall we say, more conducive to what desiring production is doing. So to put a cap on that, 
right, where this kind of lands is once again this tension between desiring production and social production kind of takes the stage here, or the tension between the unconscious and the preconscious, which if you'll recall from the fourth paralogism, right, the displacement itself, the representation repression, is a displacement of that tension between the two productions through the representation repression, right? Through the structure, um, uh, if you like, through the structure working with the limit of in incest, of which Oedipus is just one part here, right? And that's that disfiguring image uh, that Brooks was alluding to. There's an attempt at trying to walk this through all the, all the syntheses and the paralogisms really quickly to get at the meat of what they're kind of talking about here um, and building out what Brutz was giving us. Yes. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> we can move to the next paragraph, perhaps. Has anyone got questions on this, thoughts on this, any of the good stuff going on? Anyone want to bring that up? Anything, please. Now would be the time. Leaving it open for a moment, awkwardly, just trying to get anyone in. Just one final thing, since they've brought up foreclosure again, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just to contextualize it, right? Like they're talking about the imaginary and symbolic in, in a sense here. So for our purposes right now, when you're seeing foreclosure, one of the things they're getting at um, is like the exclusive disjunction or, or rather the second paralogism, right? Where the real um, kind of gets, the, 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 we would say here, the tension between social production, desiring production, one of the ways it would kind of get resolved, so to speak, is to push it into the imaginary by kind of taking down the symbolic or just kind of pushing it all the way to the symbolic, right? And these are just kind of those two poles. So it's, it's not a big thing right now for what we're, what for what Brutz and I are, are kind of going through, but just to give a little bit of context since the terms, um, that's the second time they've brought it up. Because right, it's basically when you, if the subject can't deal with the real, right, it needs the symbolic. But if the symbolic gets closed off, then they, they get stuck in the imaginary, right? So you move into like kind of a too much one pole. All right, then we will continue. <clears throat> Culturalists and ethnologists have demonstrated that institutions are primary in relation to affect and structures. For structures are not mental, they are present in things, in the forms of social production and reproduction. Even an author like Marcuse, whom one would not suspect of complacence in this regard, acknowledges that culturalism started on the right track, introducing desire into production, strengthening the link, quote, between instinctual and economic structure, and at the same time indicating the possibility of progress beyond the patrocentric acquisitive culture, end quote. Then what caused culturalism to go wrong? 
And here again, there is no contradiction, in fact, that it started on the right track, that it went wrong from the start. Perhaps the answer lies in the postulate common to Oedipal relativism and Oedipal absolutism, i.e. the stubborn maintenance of a familialist perspective which wreaks havoc everywhere. For if the institution is first understood as a familial institution, it matters little to say that familial complex varies with the institutions or that Oedipus is, to the contrary, a nuclear constant around which families and institutions turn. The culturalists invoke other triangles, maternal, uncle, aunt, nephew, for example, but the Oedipalists have no difficulty in demonstrating that these are imaginary variations of one and the same structural constant, different figures of one and the same symbolic triangulation, which are not identical either with the personages who come to realize the trans triangulation or with the attitudes that come to place these personages in relation to each other. But Inversely, the invocation of such a transcendent symbolism does not rescue the structuralists from the narrow, narrowest familial point of view. The same holds for the endless debates on, is it daddy, is it mommy? You're neglecting mother. No, you're the one who fails to see the father off to the side as an empty position. This is a... More, more fun critiques. I just wish we could get through some of the psychoanalytic shit because it's so much that we have to explain in order to get through it. Um, Cause we're ultimately just saying, throw it all out. <laughs> right. That's it's the, the functionality, right? But yeah, I mean, this is kind of structuralist. This is kind of structuralist psychoanalysis, but also like structuralist, um, say sociology for lack of a better word. Because I mean, that that's one of the unique things about what Deleuze and Guad are doing, right? Is like, if you notice whether or not they're disagreeing with um, some of the Lacanians or Lacan, they're making room in the account to talk about what the, fu not so much about like what they're invested in, um, like theoretically, but like what the function is they're actually talking about. So like with the, you know, like we were talking about structure, right? It plays a role in terms of Oedipus and how meaning is created, how interpretation can be derived in that, right? And that's one thing they're, they're really quite um, talented at as they go through this book, right? Is they're very good at um, not putting the critique in terms of like, agreement or disagreement, but straight at what does this actually do within our argument, right? What's the kind of the function of this thing they're talking about? Uh, Brits, did you have anything there? I got nothing to add here. Okay. Then. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm wanting to get through this part. I, I, I just every time we go over this stuff, it's like, hey guys, here, let's let's teach you a bunch of stuff that we then don't need to <laughs> go over. God damn. Maybe I can knock this out real quick for us then. So, like, basically, what they're getting at here, right, is um. Institute, so, okay. So institutions are primary in relation to effects and structures. So notice here that the thing they're kind of trying to get at is that it's not a mental structure. So it's not something like in the mind in some sort of mental state, right? It's not something that you, you kind of experience psychically, so to speak, or something lodged in the psychic in that general sense. What they're getting at is how structures take place or are present in things through the forms of social production and reproduction. So right, what they're driving at here is when we are talking about structure, we're talking about how it is, how it is a form of social production and reproduction. 
right? So notice the primary thing there is going to be social production. Uh, and that's important because once again, it's not couching everything in structure and then deriving um, what everything is through a kind of map. It's saying this is a kind of, some kind of spatialized map that arises through production and plays a function for production um, as opposed to the inverse. Then the point about culturalism, introducing, desiring into production, they always will agree with. The thing they kind of land on here is what caused culturalism to go wrong? The answer perhaps lies in the postulate common to the relativist and absolutist edible accounts, right? And that's the stubborn maintenance of a familialist perspective. For if the institution is first understood as a familial institution, it matters little to say that the familial complex varies with institutions or that Oedipus is to the contrary a nuclear constant around which families and institutions turn. So to really simplify this and put a point on this paragraph, right? It's almost like saying to the essence of structure goes the familial, right? And this is the thing I think they're just kind of disagreeing with here. Um, but they're also pointing out how it perpetuates some of the edipalization and how it fits into things like the familial and the alliant as we've gone through, right? So you have the institutions and the structures here, and you have, like we said, this kind of use of them to kind of derive meaning. Kind of the common substance that gets um, lodged into it, right? It's not going to be production, it's going to be the familial. So you have this as kind of like, to borrow a phrase from what's philosophy, kind of the meaning of meanings taking over the actual like um, the actual work of what's going on and this is kind of the tension they're teasing out here right is because that takes over right we get into this place where you know who's daddy really who's mommy really and that takes over from dealing with the actual structures and what's producing them as much as the institutions and what's producing them so you get this kind of bait and switch there That's what I have to offer on this paragraph. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, shall we keep going? Because I'm pretty sure, again, it's the second half of a paragraph that they stopped halfway through again. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, let's make our way through. We'll just keep, uh, we'll keep going. No, it's not. Rimka, what? <laughs> I guess they also know French. <laughs> it's, uh... No, in the original, oh, in the original French, it's uh, all one paragraph. I, I've got no idea there, but they actually have French in their profile picture. So, fair enough. <laughs> there you go. They have the signifier, man. Fair enough. We found it. Yeah, the the paragraph ends uh, with the um, with a different different position. We'll say. <clears throat> the conflict between culturalists and orthodox psychoanalysts has often been reduced to these evaluations of the respective roles of mother and father or of the pre oedipal and the oedipal without allowing either side to leave the family or even Oedipus, always oscillating between the two, the famous two poles, the pre oedipal maternal pole of the imaginary and the oedipal paternal pole of the structural, both on the same axis, both speaking the same language of a familialized social realm where one pole designates the customary maternal dialects while the other designates the imperative law of the father of the, of, 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 uh, sorry, while the other designates the imperative law of the language of the father. 
The ambiguity of what Cardiner called the primary institution has been clearly shown. In certain cases, it can be a question of the way desire invests the social field from childhood and under the familial stimuli coming from the adult. All the conditions would then be given for an adequate extrafamilial understanding of the libido. But more often, it is solely a question of the familial organization in itself, which is thought to be lived first by the child as a microcosm, then projected into an adult and social development. From this point of view, the discussion can only go around in circles between the holders of a cultural interpretation and the holders of a symbolic or structural interpretation of the same organization. To read the footnote. Mikhail Dufresne, analyzing the concepts of Cardiner, raises these essential questions. Is it the family that is primary, while the political, the economic, and the social merely secondary? Which comes first from the viewpoint of the libido, the familial investment, or the social investment? And methodologically, is it necessary to go from the child to the adult, or from the child, from the adult to the child? Um, as we make our way through all of the paralogisms, of course, uh, we had to make our way to the fifth, which the, after the, the idea and the discussion about where repression really happens. Culturalists and Orthodox psychoanalysts who talk about this always end up coming back and forth. They end up running in circles saying, no, no, it's, uh, it's because the child wasn't properly oedipalized. Well, so we need to oedipalize them now as an adult. Well, it's because the child, um, culturally we're oedipalizing the child. So it, uh, you end up running into all of these things where we start talking about the family. We start talking about the child's family specifically, not talking about the larger social structures, not talking about these other things, but instead, ultimately the question is where does it come first? Where does repression start from? Does it start from as Dufresne is bringing up here? Uh, is it that the family is primary, that it's the, it's the thing that matters that mommy, daddy, me, is it, or is it, that the child is in in a society from birth and that there's political and economic and social elements that come first, or are those merely secondary things is the, is the libido, the, the space of desire, is it first invested in this familial thing, spending more time in and being more invested in mom or dad or in repressing feelings towards mom and dad, or is it actually first social? Is it social and is it just spilling out of the family on all sides? Is it that we go from child to adult or from adult to child? Where, where is this intended to be? What is the primary institution and where does it sit? And this is, again, creating their critique, rebuilding their critique and moving forward. I mean, it's, I don't know how else to sort of summarize. That's really what that paragraph's about, continuing on from the previous. Jack, you got anything else to add? I mean, this is restating a lot of what we, we've discussed at this point. Like, even with, there's the famous two poles, right? So, like, the whole, you know, the second paralogism, but that foreclosure point's coming up again. The only thing I would really add here is, um, so, so to expand on the, the point from the previous paragraph, in a sense, like, you know, I suggest it's a kind of essence. Another way to really kind of get at what they're talking about is basically like production itself is here being taken through the condition of the familial, right? So that the familial seems to it not only explain, but be the condition for the economic and the alliant, right? Which as we've seen is something social production itself does. And all of these other things that are going on through the syntheses, right? That's kind of the point they're making here is that these behind the two poles of the um, symbolic and the imaginary, right? This, the, this kind of, um, these two poles between the culturalist and the psychoanalytic viewpoint here basically keep production in terms of the familial, which is one of the, the, the whole idea of everything being through the familial, particularly through like the, the uh, mommy, daddy, me triangle, right? That's one of the main arguments that they will make in this book is you can't put the social through the, the familial 
because how would you even talk about that, right? It's as though there'd be no social for a, fa a family to take place. You have to go from the social to the familial for them, uh, which they'll state more clearly again in chapter four, but seems helpful right now. I want to ask the, um, the question about whether uh, the Oedipal um, uh, triangulation is universal or not. Um, is it implied that uh, wherever this uh, there is this, um, you know, um, mommy, daddy, me st structure in the family, or the or that the society is a patriarchal society? Now, have they answered that? That whether you know, um, how do you determine if the if the Oedipal triangle? They're is still universal? they're still critiquing. So they're. What they're what they're going at is that inside within sort of the space of Oedipus, you'll find people sort of fighting about uh, it's about mother here, it's about father here. No, no, you're ignoring mom too much. Dad matters more, which was kind of the joke that ended the this first half of this paragraph or the last paragraph. Um, the culturalists and orthodoxists, as as they call them, they're continuing their critique sort of all the way down the line to get us to where we can break down and sort of look at the pieces of Oedipus, not talking about it as a transcendent category or a, a naturally formed thing that makes humanity. It's instead, hey, notice all of these odd things. Hey, we, where, where's the primary institution? Cardiner's got that sort of a weird thing though, because if, where does it sit? He leaves it very ambiguous. He does. Uh, he had the, what's the primary institution? He sort of plays with it being sort of this odd space of family, but also social. He doesn't really draw definitive lines. And they're like, hey, isn't that kind of weird? It's a sort of maybe social field here, but otherwise familial here. And he kind of moves around as he needs to. And so they're, they're critiquing sort of all of the steps to break us away from the idea that Oedipus is this uh, transcendent category, that it's this thing that makes uh, sort of, um, I mean, pick a psychoanalytic tradition makes us what we are, makes meaning what it is, makes everything that's eh, ultimately don't really end up getting there. It's really, we end up more often than not landing that the familial organization itself, which is first lived by the child as a, a sort of a microcosm, uh, oh, mommy, daddy, me, my relationship with them, it's microcosm. And then it's projected into adult and social development from there, which is super weird that we start that way. Aren't there other ways to sort of have that conversation and to see sort of where it comes from? Um, the, the, the phrasing that's used in the original French, I really like it's a, um, so I don't really care for sort of some of these translations make me a little confused, but the, the phrasing where he says, um, one sec, I want to make sure I get it just right. Um, uh, puis projeté dans le devenir adult et social, uh, the projected into the adult and social development, uh, devenir means, uh, becoming an adult it, that it, it's projected into the adult world as the child grows as the child becomes adult, becomes socially developed, um, there is this projection that happens. And this is what we end up doing. It's, uh, we, we scream at the child that they've got, they're a microcosm that they need to treat mommy and daddy X and Y mom does this, dad does this, learns all of these. And then as it grows, it projects out into the real world. This is usually how we talk about, um, uh, the Oedipal sort of situation that a child goes through or, or humans go through. And with this being the central sort of way that this structure is created, it just allows the cultural and the, and the orthodoxists that they've been making fun of for the last few paragraphs, just run in circles as they sort of chase each other. Uh, it's not this, it's this. Well, what about this? And this is the next paragraph, which I want to get to. Um, this is at least as long as it's supposed to be. Um, it kind it kind of gets that point. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but you can't have a uh, a familial without the uh, without the social, right? I mean, that would be you know uh, very unusual to uh, you know wouldn't it? To have a, yeah, 
there's no isolation of the familial, right? Outside the uh, outside the context of the social, right? Well, I, I would agree. And I think they would agree. I think um, uh, Freud would not necessarily agree, or he, he would say it's more maybe more irrelevant. Uh, and certainly some of his very hardcore sort of traditionalists would definitely go, look, it's, it's, it's irrelevant because uh, a child learns how to juxtapose itself against society and authority with father in the name of the father, and then uh, learn how to handle desire and stifle desire and sublimate it properly in a relationship with mother. Then from there, then everything else socially is taken care of because everything is ultimately just an extension or a replication of one of those relationships or a combination thereof. This is the this is very much a traditional sort of uh, view, and I would say uh, this is a conservative fascist view that we still run into today. Um, and so, very much, you're right. That's that's the direction of the critique they're taking it. I would say. You got anything else to add, Jack, Ben, Eris, J.K., anyone? Rimka, Lily. Oleander MC, MC. Fair enough. Next paragraph. A second postulate common to the culturalists and the symbolists should be added. They all agree that in our patriarchal and capitalist society, at least, Oedipus is a sure thing, even if they underline, as does Fromm, the elements of a new matriarchy. They all agree that our society is the stronghold of Oedipus, the starting point for re-encountering an Oedipal structure everywhere. Or, on the contrary, they hold that the terms and the relations should be made to vary within non-Oedipal complexes that are no less familial on that account. That is why our preceding criticism was directed at Oedipus as it is meant to command our respect and to function for us. It is not at the weakest point, the primitives, that Oedipus must be attacked, but at the strongest point, at the level of the strongest link, by revealing the degree of disfiguration it implies and brings to bear on desiring production, on the syntheses of the unconscious, and on libidinal investments in our cultural and social milieu. Not that Oedipus counts for nothing in our society. We have repeatedly said that Oedipus is demanded and demanded again and again. And even an attempt as profound as Lacan's at shaking loose from the yoke of Oedipus has been interpreted as an unhoped for means of making it heavier still and of resecuring it on the baby and the schizo. To be sure, it is not only legitimate, but indispensable that the ethnological and historical explanation not be in contradiction with our social organization, or that this organization contain in its own way the basic elements of the ethnological hypothesis. This is what Marx was saying as he recalled the requirements of a universal history. But, as he went on to say, provided that the current organization be capable of conducting its own criticism, the autocritique. And yet Oedipus's autocritique is something rarely seen in our organization, of which psychoanalysis forms a part. In certain respects, it is correct to question all social formations starting from Oedipus, but not because Oedipus might be a truth of the unconscious that is especially visible where we are concerned. On the contrary, because it is a mystification of the unconscious that has only succeeded with us by assembling the parts and wheels of its apparatus from elements of the previous social formations. It is universal in that sense. Thus, it is indeed within capitalist society that the critique of Oedipus must always resume its point of departure and find again its point of arrival. And finally, they bring it all back, explaining why they're making this you know, big discourse into Oedipus right after we got through the territorial machine. The, they're wanting to make sure we do and we consider and we think through the universal history as Marx described that we need to be able to not only describe how we got here, but show how this thing works now. They bring the auto critique of the system as it is now to talk through this universal history as they're discussing. 
as we look back and as they've made their, and they made their stakes in the ground very, very clear when they spoke about how Oedipus, uh, incest did not exist inside of the territorial machine, but instead why there was no incest, why the prohibition against it existed, it didn't exist as we know it. And now their critique of Oedipus begins. It's not about saying, no, there's never been an Oedipus ever. Oedipus is nothing. No, no. They want to talk about the machine that is Oedipus, the parts of the machine that have existed, how we've misidentified them and how they've changed and shifted over time and picked up new tricks along the way. Because ultimately, Oedipus is, as they say, a mystification of the unconscious that has only succeeded with us by assembling the parts and wheels of its apparatus from elements of the previous social formations. Oedipus didn't come all at once. Oedipus is made of lots of pieces of things. Oh, look, uh, see in, in these uh, primitive cultures inside of the territorial machine, they, they didn't really have uh, incest. They actually, it was, it was a, there was sort of prohibitions against it, but for different reasons. That machine isn't ours. It's not our machine of prohibition. It's a different setup of why incest did not happen. And they start naming off how symbolism worked, how meaning worked, how we began creating representations, how the ultimately incest became and shifted what it was. As this happened, as these pieces and parts and wheels of the apparatus that makes Oedipus now exists, we need to be able to trace back the elements of previous social formations that created those, that were those, that had those as its pieces. This is the universal history that we're going through in chapter three, that they're attempting to go back through and explain how we got to Oedipus and also capitalism. I like this paragraph, just to mention. Yeah, it's a good one. There you go. It's a good piece. It's a good, it's a good paragraph. It really hits sort of the notes of why they've been doing this so long. They, they, they're going to do this two or three more times in this chapter. So don't get too excited. We're not beyond it yet, but finally they're explaining, Hey, by the way, here's what we're doing. Here's how we get to universal history and really going through Marx's sort of conception of it. It's it's funny because I I think auto critique comes from Kant, so it's kind of it's, it's really amusing to read this, right? Because it's like it's almost like they're saying Marx was a good Kantian, which I I appreciate that. Um, but any, anyways, yeah. So to kind of to kind of build on this, right? It's so like the the point of the auto critique, like Brits was saying, right? Is like it's getting at self critique. So like. This is what they're doing with all the stuff we've talked about psychoanalysis, like what I was saying earlier about, like, it's not simply about disagreeing, right? It, it's about showing how this stuff functions because what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to do in, in one level is bring psychoanalysis to its auto critique, right? And they can't do that unless they actually engage with the material of psychoanalysis as they are, right? That's why the the shaman in part is being seen as the, uh, you know, as being seen as schizoanalysis for the primitive, right? Because of the way, in part, it interfaces with psychoanalysis, as it's trying to engage the primitive. So, like, if you if you look at this, right, there's kind of two senses of critique here, one of which is like this auto critique, which, if you notice this also going to appeal toward this distinction between like the syntheses and the paralogisms. Um, one thing I would emphasize here. So like when they're talking about the universalist history and that here, notice that they're very aware that to do universal history, right, of where they're standing to do it. So they recognize that this is possible as they said in 3.1, um, through where we stand in capital now, so as to go through this um, this universal this historical account, right? So in, in extension, what they're saying is, it's not as though we, we believe we've actually left the present and, and we're like in the past um, 
and this kind of coup de gras method, right? They recognize that they're accessing it through their socius, so to speak, right? That the, the socius of capital is making this account possible. And so important is that, is that they're recognizing that in that possibility is the potential for auto critique, which they're, like we've, we've just gone around and said, right? They're saying is basically the criteria of what this is about. So the point of going through all these socii and, and what we're going through here, right? On one hand, it's to get at the strongest link of, of Oedipus, right? So they're saying it's not about de-Oedipalizing the primitive, so to speak. It's about, in a, in a manner of speaking, getting at how Oedipus functions in our own um, socius so that we can kind of de-Oedipalize that socius, uh, or at least to kind of put this in a summary fashion, right? That kind of becomes the states here. Which it's we're going like, to be, yeah. True primitive, Sorry, right? go ahead. But oh, no, I just put a cap on that. It's not like who has the true primitive. It's it's kind of like who's dealing with the primitive in this way, so as to understand, so as to provide the auto critique in yes. kind of a contemporary way. Right? Like it's very much what like Foucault and and kind of contemporaries are doing. Bye, Brits. You know, and, and, and they're going to be getting into just right here what Oedipus actually is and how it operates. Uh, it's, I want to spend a moment and talk through because it's a big, there's, I mean, again, this is two paragraphs. It's originally actually just, I want to say, is it one or did they break it into three this time? Uh, uh, nope, just two. They're just broken into two again. Um, we're getting into another... Uh, really, really, really seminal moment in the book because one of the things that they've said and a word they've used often is limit. And they're going to be using limit through the rest of this book quite a bit, uh, especially when we get to chapter four. It's going to be incredibly important, uh, especially when we're talking about capital, like all of this. These next two paragraphs in this version um, define limit and talk through it. So uh, I want to take a moment and break for a second. And before we get into that, I want to ask if anyone has questions about what has been said so far today, what Jack said, what I've said, what you've read, there is no stupid questions. No one cares. Trust me. Someone else is thinking it. If you have the question, but now's the time because once we get into the limit, that's its own beast. It's going to be a bitch and a half. So I'm going to leave it awkward for a moment. Um, and uh, I'll let Jack talk or someone, but I'm going to go refill my tea. I'll be right back. I, I guess I'll cover the floor then. Anybody have any questions or comments? Nobody? Everyone's grasping this perfectly. Is that what's really happening here? All right. I'm not going to fight it. Let's talk about limits. Oedipus is. The limit does not exist, for us. <laughs> that hurt. That physically hurt. Oedipus is a limit, but limit has many different meanings since it can be at the beginning as an inaugural event in the role of a matrix or in the middle as a structural function, ensuring the mediation of personages in the ground of their relations or at the end as an eschatological determination. Now we have seen that it is only in this last sense that Oedipus is a limit. This is also the case for desiring production. But in fact, this last sense itself can be understood in many different ways. In the first place, desiring production is situated at the limits of social production, the decoded flux at the limits of the codes and territorialities, the body without organs at the limits of the socius. We shall speak of an absolute limit every time the schizo flux pass through the wall scramble all the codes and de the socius. The body without organs 
is the deterritorialized socius, the wilderness where the decoded flux run free, the end of the world, the apocalypse. Secondly, however, the relative limit is no more nor less than the capitalist social formation, because the latter engineers machines and mobilizes flux that are effectively decoded, but does so by substituting for those codes a quantifying axiomatic that is even more oppressive. With the result that capitalism, in conformity with the movement by which it counteracts its own tendency, is continually drawing nearer the wall, while at the same time pushing the wall further away. Schizophrenia is the absolute limit, but capitalism is the relative limit. Thirdly, there is no social formation that does not foresee or experience a foreboding of the real form in which the limit threatens to arrive, and which it wards off with all the strength it can command. Whence the obstinacy with which the formations preceding capitalism encast the merchant and the technician, preventing flux of money and flux of production from assuming an autonomy that would destroy their codes. Such is the real limit. Such a good line. Uh, do we want to stop here? I think we have to. It's a, I, I would. Yeah. How do we start? Go for it, Jack. You start. Sure. Uh, so there's, there's this, so the focus is on limits, right? There's three different ways they introduce the limit, what a limit can do. And then they're going to take that and put it into kind of what they're really interested in, which is two specific um, types of limits, right? So to, to kind of approach it in that way, right? A limit can appear at the beginning, right? So it's like kind of the big bang. There was nothing prior to the Big Bang, so to speak, or at least that's kind of how I think of limits, right? It's that which gives us this kind of inaccessible beyond or, or something that just simply can't be comprehended beyond that, right? Um, or in the role of a matrix, as they noted, right? There's nothing prior to um, a matrix in a kind of Foucaultian sense, not in a, um, a Keanu Reeves sense. It, a limit can be in the middle as a structural function, ensuring the mediation of personages in the ground of their relations. So in the sense in the, in the middle, right? Like you can kind of think of like a golden proportion here, right? The, the limit, the bisecting, so to speak, right? It's in a kind of middle of the line or of the shape. The, the more important thing here is when in the middle, it mediates so that you have kind of the ground coming from the limit. This is very similar to how they've described incest for um, kind of this chasm between the intensive and extensive filiative and alliant, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the ways that limit functions or is the end of an eschatological determination, right? So like a like kind of end times after which, you know, it's again, it's kind of incomprehensible. And that's a kind of common theme here in the sense that there's a kind of boundary being drawn. Um, as far as Oedipus goes, right, what they're focusing on here is that Oedipus seems to function as that kind of apocalyptical thing, right? It's kind of the end times after which who knows what comes next, right? That's kind of like how Fisher describes capital, right? And I'm, I'm not interested in debating him on it. But in that sense in which he says, we can't conceive of what would come next, right? It's a kind of similar point here in that Oedipus seems to almost stave off a kind of future. Um, this is also the case for desiring production. So taking this out of the temporal and putting it into the network, right? What they're basically going to do now is they're going to shift into what they're really interested in, which is how limits function in a, in a relative sense in an absolute sense, right? And if, if you were with us in the what is philosophy reading, um, 
they use a similar terminology there. So some of this should seem familiar. Um, so basically, right, like one thing we've seen is part of the function of the limit is to create a marginalization. And that's a marginalization of desired production, right? Um, so the, the syntheses in their general use, the BWO, right? That's the kind of thing that's being limited here and that's taking on the marginalization. That's why it has to be represented through the germinal influx because it, it doesn't give itself to codification. So with that, right, there's two ways they're gonna get at this. The absolute limit is when the, uh, the schizo flow is passed through the wall, strangling the codes and deterritorializing the socius. And you honestly, the BWO is the deterritorialized socius. Uh, kind of the point here is like, you think about what's going on in social production, right? It's very contextualized and they'll even say kind of relative to social production. It's through that regime, right? It's through the regime of the socio, so to speak. In that sense, right, it keeps everything relative to codification. Um, and even with capital, when we get into decodification, it keeps it kind of relative to the social body, right? For which the BWO is kind of a marginalized territory. So if you're thinking like, um, Oh, I, I think it's Tennyson's Ulysses, right? Those kind of pillars of Hercules you don't pass. It's kind of that idea of the boundary, right? But without like, um, you know, it's not necessarily uh, greener grass. The more important point is, this is a boundary that is permeable, right? The flows can cross the limit as though they've shot through a wall. Um, and I think they mean that quite literally, to be honest with you, because this is the line of escape, right? This is where something coded passes into, um, it's like, and what is philosophy? It's like the metaphysical, right? But passes into the syntheses um, in their proper use and functions in this molecular way. So in a sense, right, we're moving from social production and like pre-conscious power or investments um, or like the things we've talked about into a, a place where their mutability um, is more molecular and, and therefore takes on a whole different potential, right? This is where you get that revolutionary potential um, for a kind of social change because upon the BWO, if it re-enters the social body, right, so or so to speak, if desiring production conditions social production now, you have a subversion, right? And that's kind of this revolutionary investment because at the relative limit, right? Which would now we're kind of taking away the BWO for a minute. Uh, at the relative limit, right? Which they're focusing on um, as capitalism, to put it at a, I put it in a word, right? It engineers and mobilizes flows that are effectively decoded, but does so by substituting the codes for a, qual a quantifying axiomatic that is even more impressive. We'll deal with the axiom when we get there. For now, just notice that what it does is it works with codification as a quantification. So it's similar to intensities in that sense, but in this sense, it's almost like it's using a kind of set number to do to condition the codes, right? And an extension to condition decoding. So it's relative to the regime of social production here, limited as capitalism, right? So in this sense, right, we're talking about things bouncing off the wall so that within the network of the full social body, the change, so to speak, right? Um, the change in the synthesis, the use of the synthesis stays relative to capitalism in that sense, not in like an ideological, um, you know, kind of a larger economic model sense, but in this general sense of the way that capital creates this network, because we're moving between two forms of full bodies, right? The social body, um, which I'm focusing on capital following them here, it can also be the primitive as we've seen, versus um, the, the kind of metaphysical body of the body without organs or the deterritorialized 
Celsius, as they call it here. Uh, that's a lot of words, though. I'll give the uh, I'll open the floor up from there. I don't have a ton to add. Um, when we talk about a big thing for me is just getting, cause they're going to go into all of this again in depth. So don't feel like you have to nail it all in this paragraph. The thing to take from this paragraph is how they're talking about absolute and relative limits. And I think Jack gave a, a fantastic sort of rundown of those two. So I don't have much to add there. Um, all of these things are going to be built out and transferred and done more done with. So. Thanks, Sylvia. I appreciate that. I guess the only thing I'd tack on to, to what I've said is, thirdly, there is no social formation that does not foresee your experience or foreboding of the real form in which the limit threatens to arrive and which it wards off with all the strength it can command. So this is the other side of the limit, or this is another function of the limit. Right, it's kind of, um, if I say insulatory, it's probably gonna give the wrong connotation. But if you notice, right, we're seeing this language of foreseen, just like we've kind of talked about with the eschatological, right? The coming, to use a, Bl a Blanchovian term, is implicated here, right? A, a, a kind of difference arriving, so to speak, um, and a kind of obstinacy toward that difference arriving. Right, which would basically be like, you know, eventually what we'll, we'll find out, right, is like they're kind of driving at like a fourth socius here, right? Um, but we'll deal with that more when we get there. I agree. All right, well, with that, um, I'm actually not going to want to move into the next paragraph because we have like two minutes left. Um, That'd be about it. I think for today, we're going to continue from here. Uh, we'll make our way through. I think we'll actually be finishing out this section next week, which is great. Yeah. We should be able to finish it now to next week. It looks like. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank all of you for joining. This has been lovely as always highlight of my week. <laughs>